All right, it's uh, 7.01 according to my phone, so why don't we get started? Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, thank you. So this is Monday, February 26th. It is the regularly scheduled meeting um, of the Finance Committee. Um, council uh, Committee members present at the start of the meeting, uh, Councilor Greenberg from Ward 1, Council Malachy from Ward 3, Councilor Gentile from Ward 4, Councilor Humphrey from Ward 5, Councilor Bixby from Ward 6, Councilor Grossman uh, from Ward 7. And uh, I believe that I spoke to Councilor Lipoff earlier. I expect him here and uh, hopefully Councilor Mickley. Um, one uh, piece of news as far as staffing, I think that both, both of you know, and looks like Councilor Lipoff has also joined us already. Um, that Evan Kudmore, Kudmore, who has been um, staffing the Finance Committee, um, has accepted another position um, he, uh, closer. He's had quite a long commute, and he's found um, another position uh, closer to his home. Uh, I'm happy for him in that respect, but also, but. Um, he will be missed. I'd only work with him for close to two months, but he was doing a great job. So I wish him the best. The other part of that is, is um, Cassidy Flynn drew the short straw and she's going to be working with me and the committee um, and taking over. Uh, Cassidy's done this before. So, and we've worked together before. So um, it's great that she's around to step in. You probably all saw, and we've been joined by uh, Councilor Mickley, so we have a full committee. Uh, you probably saw an email from Cassidy earlier uh, sending out um, a revised uh, paperwork on regarding the agenda. I want to just assure everybody that there have been no changes to the actual agenda. There aren't any docket items that have been removed or docket items that have been added. Um, it was really a couple of board orders um, and one other backup piece of material that had been sent out. So it's the same agenda that you got, um, you know, in your packet. So uh, having said that, good, as I said, we got a full agenda, so let's get going on it. Uh, the first item is docket item 22-24. Uh, this is the... Uh, Community Preservation Committee recommending the appropriation of $125,500 in Community Pres Preservation Act funding from the FY 2024 Historic Resource Reserve Funds to the Planning and Development Department for a grant to the Second Church um, in Newton um, for restoration. This was has already been approved in zoning and planning, and now it is obviously here in finance. Um, is there someone from the Community Preservation Committee that's going to present or some or someone from our staff? So Eliza Data is going to present his chair, and I'm Molly Hutchings, if I haven't met you already, and I'm on staff for CPC. Thank you. Eliza? Yes. Good evening, Welcome. everyone. Uh, thank you, Councillor Gentile, and, and thank you, members of the committee. We're just going to give a, a brief presentation. We know you have a full agenda tonight. Molly has some slides to share. Okay, can everyone see those okay? Yes. Yes, I'm saying no, it's great. Okay, so... Um, as, I, as Molly mentioned, my name is Eliza Data. I live at 40 Homer Street in Newton Center. I'm presenting tonight on behalf of the Community Preservation Committee, where I'm currently serving as chair. Uh, thank you again for making time on the agenda tonight. Um, so we're gonna just walk you briefly through the CPC's recommendation to allocate FY24 CPA funds to the second church in Newton restoration project. So um, as you can see from this slide, there's an image of the church. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, it's located at 60 Highland Street in West Newton. Um, 
The structure was originally built in 1916, and it's listed on the National Register of Historic Places, which is an eligibility requirement for receiving CPA funds under the historic preservation category. The church provides community meeting space for a variety of local groups, and in particular, music rehearsal and performance space due to the building's outstanding acoustics. Um, if we can go to the next slide, we'll share just a little bit informa uh, information about the scope and the project. So the proposed project involves restoration of the masonry and replacement of the roof and drainage system at the main entrance to the building. This work is categorized as restoration and not routine maintenance, uh, which has made it eligible for state historic funds and restoration of a historic resource is also an eligible use of CPA funds. The church received a matching grant of $50,000 from the state through the Mass Historic Commission, uh, which has also reviewed and approved the proposed scope of work. And if CPA funds are approved, the church is prepared to complete the work by June of this year. So Molly, if you could just go to the budget slide. So as you can see here, the project Budget includes the $50,000 from Mass Historic, which has been awarded, along with other funds raised by the church through donations and their endowment. The CPA request of $125,500 represents less than 50% of the total budget, which is in line with the CPC's guidelines for leveraging matching funds. Um, and then we can just go to the next slide, Molly. Thank you. So uh, the CPC voted at its November meeting to recommend this funding request for $125,500. These funds would be drawn from the FY24 set aside for historic preservation. And then finally, um, thank you for your consideration. We'll open things up if there are any questions. And I just wanna mention that Laura Foote, a board member at the church is also here tonight. If there are any specific questions on the church or the project. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Eliza, and thank you for the uh, presentation. Um, are there questions from members of the Finance Committee? Um, let me start with Council Grossman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, this is obviously a really uh, beautiful and, yes, historic uh, building and I supported the Grace Church item, which obviously was a different, uh, different church, different need. My main question is when you're evaluating these types of project proposals before the CPC right now, how are you making determinations about projects of merit with respect to historical preservation, specifically with respect to some of um, these buildings that are religious in nature. And really where I'm just sort of going with it in my mind is recognizing that we have a lot of these types of really uh, beautiful buildings of merit with need for historical preservation. And I'm just wondering how you're wrestling with that as a committee. Great, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, we. So when we re receive pre-proposals and invite groups to come for a full proposal, we review the pre-proposals against uh, the CPC's guidelines for projects. And those include items like um, funding match, um, importance to the community, is it a community asset, um, the project team, you know, their readiness to proceed. So there are a series of, of evaluation criteria that we use. Um, and in the case of historic, resources, there are certain kind of eligibility criteria that we also review, which this project meets. Uh, it has to be on the National Regi Register of Historic Places, for example, and the nature of the work has to be restoration or preservation to be eligible for CPA funds. So we, we discuss those items as well. Um, and in this case, the, um, the proposal that the Second Church put forward met all of those guidelines. Um, we um, we see, you know, a handful of historic preservation applications each year, but not, a, you know, not a ton. So we were happy to receive one in this category. Um, and the conversation um, among the members was uh, in favor of, of what they put forward. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And 
certainly appreciate the very thoughtful process you and your colleagues on the committee go through every time you bring one of these before us. It's always also a, a very thorough presentation and uh, I appreciate it. So that's all for me for right now. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mickley. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, definitely uh, agree with uh, Council Grossman that you know, this seems like a beautiful effort, a uh, project that will bring, uh, you know, just uh, make the church look better and be a good fit for the neighborhood. Um, I have a few questions. The first is uh, how you think about how often to fund projects like these. Um, you know, the previous church uh, that I think was funded for repair of a steeple a, a year or two ago, I think that was a much larger order of magnitude. I think it was 1.5 million or something like that. So this um, order of magnitude feels a lot better. And also what I like about this is that under 50% of the funds are going are coming from the community preservation funds. Um, but just wondering how you think about, you know, how much to prioritize churches over all the other historical needs, but also the other um, CPA priorities, um, you know, around green space and parks and affordable housing, how you balance those competing needs. And the other question is, what would happen if we didn't make this grant? Would the funding be available from the church or elsewhere, or is this grant absolutely needed in order to make this project go forward? Yeah. So I'm I'm going to answer the first one, and I'll let Laura answer the second question about kind of timing and the funding. But with respect to how we think about availability of funds and how to allocate those funds, it kind of comes in two parts. One is that we we need applicants to come before us with projects, and so we, you know, we are thinking about the different categories that we fund, but we we only review the projects that are ready to go and and show us the application and the information that we need. Um, I, I believe, um, Molly, did we include some of our budget slides? Because uh, we often get this question about, you know, how we're doing against the different uh, categories mm -hmm. that we fund and what our budget looks like. So this, um, actually, why don't we go to that first slide, Molly? I think that's helpful just to give folks a sense of where the budget stands. So Molly helps us update this every month. Um, we look at our um, balance at the beginning of the year, the surcharge we're expecting um, through the CPA program, we get a state match, uh, which adds to our available funds. And so we can we get a snapshot of what we have available. And then we track what we have recommended um, over the course of the year. So some of those obligations are bond obligations that we've made in prior years, and they kind of continue on an annual basis. To date, it's Webster Woods, but we also approved um, bond obligations for the gaff pool and the athletic fields, which will enter into the equation in FY25. Um, and then this year, um, in addition to the Webster Woods obligation, we've, we've made funding authorizations of about $2 million. And so to date, um, our expenses are about 2.9, but that leaves us $7 million for FY24. And then you can see um, kind of how that rolls into FY25. So as a group, when we get proposals um, and we're looking at potential funding recommendations, we look at them in the context of what our budget is. And then Molly, maybe the next slide would be helpful too, just to kind of in terms of how we allocate. So, um, this is also a, another table we keep updated, and it's it's on the CPC website. But we we have different um, targets for each of the categories that we fund, um, and and the amount of funding we actually award varies from year to year depending on what applications come through. Um, but you can get a snapshot of you know where we are for the last five years and then all the way back to the beginning of the program which i think is just over 20 years now for newton so hopefully that answers some of your question about how we allocate um and i think your other question was about uh what happens if if the cpa funds aren't available and and laura if you wouldn't mind answering that one sure <laughs> hi i'm laura but from um west newton and i'm one of the board members of the second church um we would probably not be able to go ahead with the restoration and we'd have to sacrifice the grant that we did get from the mass historical commission because of the their economies of scale in terms of setting up the scaffolding 
So if we had to reduce the scope of what we would be working on, we would end up spending like almost half of the cost just to get the scaffolding up. So we really were hoping to do the full scope. We had a study done a year ago to identify their priorities and uh, what what the scope is for this project is what was deemed urgent. Um, and I think, you know, another way to think about this and think about all the preservation projects is when, at the time that it was built, people were inspired by their faith to hire an excellent architect. In today's era, the people from the church itself are probably less than 10% of the activity in the building. We also have a Jewish congregation that worships in a different sanctuary, a second sanctuary. We have a nursery school, we have Al-Anon, we have Girl Scouts, we have a pediatric therapy practice now that's growing, that does occupational and speech therapy for children. Um, so there are many, many other users of the building, um, all of whom serve the community and none of whom help to pay to keep to keep the stonework from falling down. Um, so that's uh, where this project uh, fits in. That, that's great. My follow-up was gonna be, how does this serve the broader community? But you got ahead of that, Laura. So thanks for that uh, explanation and really helped me understand this project. Well, we usually mention that we also host the uh, Newton Piano Summit. Um, we have the previous two years, um, terrific attendance from the community for that. Uh, not a religious event, um, but they're, I think they're taking a pause this year, so we, they won't be there in, in uh, March to be bothered by the scaffolding. So it's a, it's a good time to do it. And uh, we're trying to avoid larger structural issues. I don't know if any of you folks heard about the church in New London, Connecticut, that had a stone tower that collapsed in about 10 seconds. So we're, that's not us, um, but we, we don't want to see that happen. Thanks. All set, yeah. David. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, Laura, thank you. That's helpful information for us to have as far as all of the other activities that are going on there. Um, are there any other hands that I'm not seeing? Council Humphrey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as I did on the uh, previous aforementioned other church project, I'll be voting no. It's not personal. I think I'm sure it's a good project and a worthwhile building and everything, but um, I'm going to be consistent. I don't believe it's appropriate to be using government funds for a religious purpose like this. And um, we've also got a lot of religious institutions with dwindling bases and financials. And um, I'd like to figure out a way to help them as a community, but uh, not through government resources. So I'll be voting no. Thank you. Okay. Molly, did you have something? Just something to add to Councillor Mickley's question. Um, in terms of how often we might fund a project of this scope, uh, I do want to just interject that this kind of work, um, Eliza mentioned that it's restoration work, it's not maintenance work. This is like a every 20 to 30 year pro kind of project that would happen at, on a structure like this. And I do think it's important to say that a project of this scope that's $125,000 prevents the sort of damage and water infiltration that can lead to multi-million dollar projects being necessary. Okay, thank you. Councillor Greenberg. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'm, I'm in support of this item. Um, this is a, an historic landmark that offers a connection to our past and a sense of place for Newton. And it's important, despite that it's a church, it's an, an historic building that we need to preserve. So I will support this item. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other hands, Councillor, oh no, wait, you're uh, uh, Councillor Lipoff, go right ahead. Thank you, I'm sorry. I was uh, going to say the exact same thing that Councillor Greenberg did, uh, and I uh, second her comments, thank you. Okay, Councilor Malachy, would you like to make a motion? I think you're muted. I, I've been staying muted because I never know when this dog is going to start barking. Um, and I would be happy to move it. I'm very happy to see this um, progressing. Okay, so there is um, a motion to approve the item. Um, 
All those, I think we can do this on a voice vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Uh, any abstentions? All right, so the item passes seven in favor with one opposed. All right, thank you all for showing up on this item. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next item is 99-24, her honor the mayor requesting authorization to accept and expend funds in the amount of 27,500 from the National Environmental Health Association for the purpose of improving the city's conformance with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's retail program standards by the Health and Human Services Department. Who's going to help us with this? Hi, Ms. Hi, Ross. Hi, you. <laughs> nice to see you. Go right ahead, please. Thank you so much. Um, this is money that we will get from the National um, Environmental Health Association to help our environmental health inspectors. Um, perform their regular duties actually in um, all of our restaurants. It helps pay for our inspection software. A lot of the materials and inspection equipment that we use, it helps an audit, do an audit to make sure that we're meeting the standards. Um, I, only $27,500, but uh, it goes a long way. So um, we would appreciate uh, if you moved it through. Okay, thank you. Questions? Can I get a motion? I'll move it. Motion to approve by Council Maliki. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? All right, motion passes unanimously, eight to zero. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm um, gonna stand by for item number five, but thank you very much. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, well, I, admit I should have put them back to back, but anyway, uh, we'll get there shortly. Uh, docket item 113-24, Her Honor the Mayor requesting authorization to accept and expend $30,785 in grant funds from the Massachusetts Office of Dis on Disability for Williams Elementary School Playground Accessibility Improvements. And I believe Jeannie Fairley is here and is probably here to present this item. So go right ahead, Jeannie. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Chair Gentile. Um, I didn't present a, prepare um, anything slide wise, but I'll be happy to explain. Um, this uh, grant program uh, is annual for the last seven years or so. And um, I get the input from the Commission on Disability uh, to um, choose a project that we will apply for as the city. I, I am the one that applies for it, but it's uh, you know on behalf of the city. Um, this year, uh, well, we've known about this for about a year. Um, the, the playground at uh, Williams School, there's a special program that got that opened at Williams School, um, elementary school, uh, about a year and a half ago called Reflections. And um, the children, many of them, and, and some in the regular um, classes, uh, have uh, physical disabilities uh, and other disabilities. Um, and uh, their playground, although it meets the very minimum accessibility requirements. Um, uh, it doesn't have a sw any swings. And these children, uh, to regulate themselves also to just have fun, uh, there are no swings at, uh, um, at Williams Playground. Um, the COD has already um, authorized, and I think, well, you might not have been shared when it went through last fall, but um, some monies to go towards other things that the, the school playground needs, but they, there wasn't enough um, money to do that. So I applied for this grant. Um, there's a 20% match from the city. Uh, the total was a little over $38,000 to buy, purchase and install a swing structure um, that will hold, I believe, six typical swings and two accessible swings. Um, also for the uh, matting and the, um, the foundation underneath, which will be more like an extension of their play structure materials already, which is um, extending a timber around the edge, making sure that there's a access to, to that with uh, wood chips and um, rubber matting on top of that. So uh, that the grant is for, as I said, 80% um, of, of the total, 
$785. And I was very pleased to receive this grant. This is the second grant the city has received in the seven years that the program has been open. Um, and it has to be about accessibility, has to improve um, you know, more accessibility or start accessibility. And the, the other one was to put in a lot of accessible pedestrian signals all over the city. So um, we would like, uh, if you need, I, I'm here to answer any questions. I may not have covered everything. Um, this will be um, taken taken uh, care of by the Parks and Rec Parks Recreation and Culture Department. Um, they furnish the um, the cost estimate and the um, the uh, the material. You know the 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 information I needed for the grant, and they will be in charge of um, doing this this spring because it's a very short turnaround for this this grant. Um, it pretty much we have to present invoices um, by June 30th for everything that we do for this particular project. Okay. This June 30th. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, Commissioner Banks, did you want to add anything? Hi, good evening. Thank you, Chair Gentile. Um, so I just wanted to be here tonight to answer questions, um, but also just a big thank you to um, our ADA coordinator, Jeannie, as well as uh, Luis Perez de Marizzi from Parks, Recreation and Culture Office. Um, we've been discussing the Williams site um, for a little while now. I know I've been with city council a couple of times. Uh, this grant will really allow us to um, move the program ahead, get the swings. Um, it is it is six swings total. So there'll be four um, general belt swings and two accessible swings um, all on one singular um, swing set. Um, but we'll also be able to do some of the upgrades um, with the overall site project, including putting some um, accessible tables in. Um, and we're working with the Department of Public Works uh, for accessible pathways to the swings um, and to other areas of the play space. Um, so we expect this to be a really nice um, improvement there. And the Reflections program has been great to work with. Um, the, everybody's really just jumped right in to, to make this happen quickly. Um, for the students. So it seems like they have, this is East, the second, but I, I seem to remember even a third time when someone had gotten some funds for this um, particular program. So um, folks are doing a great job getting grants for this program. I thank you for that. Um, are there um, any questions from any city councils? Um, Seeing none, this is in Ward 4. I appreciate maybe if somebody else would make a uh, motion on this. I'll move approval. All right. Council Greenberg has moved approval. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. aye. Uh, opposed? Abstentions? Okay. The motion passes unanimously, 8 to 0. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Okay, moving on to docket item 110-24, Her Honor the Mayor requesting authorization to accept and expend $35,000 from the Executive Office of Public Safety and the State Department of Fire Services for a reimbursement grant that was awarded to the Newton Fire for Firefighter Safety Equipment. I see the Chief, and I also see Mr. I see us, Mr. Uh, Bianchi, I believe, is also here. You guys decide. Uh, Michael, I'm sorry. T what's your title? I, I apologize for not knowing. Problem counselor, assistant chief. Assistant chief. I should know that. Okay. Chief, you want to start it off? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, counselor Gentile. Uh, this is for a $35,000 grant. Uh, it is a reimbursement grant, so we are asking to expend $35,000 uh, and then have that money reimbursed from the state's Department of Fire Services. This is for uh, equipment. We have uh, picked out a few items uh, that the uh, department feels um, is most needed. Uh, some of these items are ballistic vests and helmets, uh, a hydrogen cyanide detector, uh, some hoses, valves, and nozzles for our high-rise uh, firefighting, uh, and also a ventilation fan. Um, be happy to answer any questions on the equipment or uh, or the grant in general. Thank you. 
Assistant Chief Bianchi, did you want to add anything since you took the time to be here? I think uh, Chief Gentile covered it, but I will jump in if there's a question. Okay. Questions from members of the committee? Okay. Seeing none, I didn't miss anybody, I hope. I see none, so can I get a motion? I'll move approval. All right, Council Humphrey has moved approval. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, uh, abstentions. Okay, motion passes unanimously eight to zero. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Thank you, Councilors. Okay. Next item, 98-24, Hirana, the mayor, requesting authorization to transfer the opioid mitigation funds, in which total in the amount of $446,104.67 for use by the Health and Human Services Department into a special revenue fund as allowed by state law in December of 2023. Um, that date is significant. It was a significant change in state law that allows funds like this to uh, be set up. Um, there's, I believe, a lower threshold to move the funds. Um, and I assume that's why, you know, this is coming to us now. So, uh, Commissioner, I know you were here for that also, so please um, explain what's going on here in the request. Thank Counselor you very much. Gentile, um, I, I, if you don't mind, um, Commissioner Walsh, I, I'll speak on it because this is more of an accounting change. We already approved the item back in November. Um, so this is, um, the item before you is to change the accounting on Council Order 35723. Okay. And prior to December of 2023, um, Mass General Law required opioid funds to be unbudgeted general fund revenues, or there were a few other options like a setting up a stabilization fund, but the city handled them as unbudgeted general fund revenues. Um, this would require the city and all municipalities to appropriate these funds out of free cash for specific projects each year, essentially tying up a portion of what is viewed as free cash, but it, it actually has a restriction because it must be used for opioid mitigation. Um, back in November, the city moved forward with that and they moved out the 446,000 to a continued appropriation account under the direction of um, Ms. Walsh to do the opioid mitigation. Um, this change that I'm requesting is to move this into a special revenue fund. And that special revenue fund is what opioid funds from now going forward to the next 15, 20 years, when we continue to get them and spend them, all opioid funds will be in this special revenue fund. And so this ask is just to move the original appropriation over to that same special revenue fund. So all accounting and reporting can be handled out of one account. So one question then is, um, all right, so we follow your suggestion and the funds are moved. If the commissioner wants to use the money for some particular project, does she then need additional approval from the city council in order to spend the money that's in this new account that you're recommending? No. And so um, this account here that the funds have already been appropriated out to um, health and human services would not need any more approval from council. And going forward, all opioid funds received in FY24 for the future do not require any council approval to use those funds. Um, there are certain state guidelines in which all opioid funds need to follow. Um, and I know that HHS will be working with the administration on and probably um, council, I don't know that um, part of it, which I'm sure can be spoken about, but um, on best uses and practices on how to use those funds. But there is no um, requirement to um, None of these funds need to go before council. Okay. That answers my question. I see that Maureen has her hand up. I'm going to recognize her. 
And then after that, uh, Commissioner Walsh, I think it would be helpful if you could maybe speak to, you know, how these funds, you see these funds being used, okay? So Maureen? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood that these are actually uh, fiscal 23 funds. These are the funds that we uh, received last year. It took the state a while to determine how it was going to have municipalities handle the funds. So we now have received, I want to say, at least about $80,000 this year. Um, so that money will automatically, and, and Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, that money will go directly to this, this um, special revenue fund. But so this is all fiscal 23 money that we, you know, clearly identified along the way because we weren't quite sure how we were going to handle it. We knew it would have stipulations attached to it. And so this is last year's money. Okay. Yes. Um, so just to clarify, I, I put the numbers together. Last year, we received the 446000 Drop to free cash. We appropriated that out uh, in November. This year, we've received seventy-seven thousand to date, but we're expecting to receive four hundred and seventy-three thousand in FY twenty-four. And overall, the city expects to receive about three point eight million over the course of fifteen, seventeen years. Um, there's a chance that that number could grow a little bit. All right. So uh, let me recognize Commissioner Walls to talk about ways in which these funds um, are used. And Commissioner, um, despite everybody's best effort, and this is what I'd be interested in hearing about, um, fentanyl continues to be a major, major problem and people are continuing to lose their lives. And I guess in your comments, I'd be interested to know what's going on with you know, trying to deal with that situation. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, in anticipation of getting these funds, we uh, created a coalition uh, in the fall of 2022. The opioid epidemic has been ravaging this country. Uh, it has not ceased. Um, Newton is not immune. We lose people every year to um, opioid um, overdoses. And you're absolutely right. Councilor Gentile, fentanyl is just in the drug stream now and people um, die from uh, one-time uses. So in anticipation of this money, because we signed on to the settlement um, many years ago, uh, knowing that we would um, hopefully be part of the settlement funds and there are a lot of monies coming our way, uh, we set up this great group of people, people um, from all of our city departments, our schools, our police, our fire, um, people who are residents in Newton, who have lived experience, who have children um, that um, they have gone through this experience with, and people who have lost their family members. So this coalition really informs our work. They've been doing a lot of work over the past months um, and years to make sure when we spend this money that it gets directly to the people who need it. This money is very, very clearly defined for its use. We are audited. We have reports that we have to give um, under different categories like connection to care, harm reduction, substance use disorder treatment. Um, the first few, uh, at least the initial push um, for the use in the money is going to be threefold. We will start to put opioid overdose rescue kits in all of our public buildings. If you're familiar with an Arcan, that is a rescue medication. So if you think of an AED in the boxes that we have at City Hall and all our public buildings and all of our schools, we put stop the bleed kits a couple of years back because of uh, violence um, uh, and with guns. So now we have stop the bleed kits. Now we're gonna add opioid overdose rescue kits in all our public buildings. Because we're a large city, that is that represents about $100,000, <laughs> but we also have the funds to start to roll out um, those rescue kits. You'll see them. You've all already seen them in some places like Boston, Cambridge, and other cities, um, and you will see them in Newton. Uh, we are partnering with a wonderful partner at Newton Wellesley Hospital. They have a substance use services clinic that's stood up um, and has wonderful people that... Um, 
work with our residents directly. We will be uh, partnering with them so that we can get direct access for people in families um, that are trying to stay sober, that need treatment. This is a tough, addiction is a tough area of medicine. It is usually not one and done. Um, you gotta hang in there with people. So we will be working with them directly um, to benefit our residents. And the third thing is really to get out there in community events to make sure that people know the resources, have a you know a warm handoff to people who can help them through this, um, all the way from in school, because we're working with our Newton Public Schools, to out of school, to young adults, and it even really does hit our older populations. Um, so across the ages, we have a lot of work to do. It's great that we're going to be getting this much money in order to start our work, but I wanted to give you a little bit of insight into um, the three areas that will start the ground running. Um, many more to come, many more ideas to come, many more best practices to make sure that people um, can fight this disease, most importantly, prevent it for our young people. Um, and we do have a great coalition with people who, with energy and expertise um, to help us do that. So that is our plan um, going forward now that we have this money that we actually can use where we knew it was coming, uh, but it wasn't yet accessible. So that's exciting um, and good things to come for this area, which you're absolutely right, President Gentile, it's taken too many people, um, Chair Gentile, that's taken too many people already. We would like to make a dent in that in prevention. Okay, thank you. Um, questions from the committee? Okay, I know this was discussed last term and this is um, really just a, a bookkeeping of the actual monies, but all right. So if there are no questions, um, can I get a motion, please? Move of approval. Motion to approve by Councillor Humphrey. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, motion passes uh, unanimously. Thank you. Okay, next item, 111-24. We're honor the mayor requesting authorization to the Newton Public Schools to issue an RFP with a food service management company for a contract duration of up to five years. I believe that, that is, this is simply here tonight, not for anything to do with the an actual contract, but to anything over three years, I believe, needs council approval, and that's why it's here. Um, this, who's here to... to uh, Speak on that, Liam. I'm, I'm, I'm here, Chair Gentel. How are you? Good evening, everyone. Good. Go right ahead. Okay. Uh, thanks. Hi, everybody. I'm at uh, also doing. Uh, we're doing double duty. School committees going on right now. So this is a request to you folks. We've come before you uh, before. I think it was about six years ago. The last time we went out to bid, we have a vendor right now. We've contracted food services out. Uh, for a number of years, we have a company currently called Whitson's. Uh, we've had a pre-bid uh, meeting and we've had six companies come through on the pre-bid. So simply this is a, this is a, a, Desi actually has put out a new template for us. And this is really the standard practice for districts to go out for five years. And the main reason, reason is really to attract and retain hopefully a, a, a good quality uh, company to come in. This is a big investment for a, a food service operation. Um, they have approximately 80 staff members. So the idea is for somebody, particularly if we're going to have a, a new company come in or even Whitson's uh, or existing, you know, existing company, they want to know that they can invest and be here for a while. Uh, we also do this with our transportation, our yellow bus contract as well. Um, the way this is technically set up is it's, it's, it's a one year with four one year options. So to the extent that we were not happy at any point during the term or, or so unhappy, we would not, you know, have to renew the vendor if we did not want to, but it does allow us, um, ideally with the, with picking the right um, uh, vendor through the RFP process, that this vendor can really make a commitment to us and we make a commitment to that vendor uh, to supply uh, food to all our students. So that's the main gist of it, Chair Gentile, um, really kind of simply trying to, to attract uh, good vendors. We had Aramark, Chartwell's, a company called Genuine Foods, uh, another company called Kate. K-12 by Elior, 
another company called Sodexo, which was our former vendor. They're again back uh, back looking at it in Whitson. So six vendors are looking, which I like the competition. And this is a way for us to hopefully attract this competition and that they can uh, can take a serious uh, bid at Newton. A little better than um, how many bids you typically get for bus contracts, eh? That's only one. We've only had one so far for the last number of years, and that's been very frustrating, yes. All right, questions. Just authorizing them to go five years. Uh, let me start with Councilor Malachy and then Councilor Bixby. Um, I'm just curious, um, Mr. Hurley, is, is this more um, uh, companies with interest than you've had in the past? You know, it is. It actually has been. Thank you. Um, I think that we had three companies last time. And I think one of the things that really has changed, if you're, you may not be following public school um, uh, school lunches, but all school lunches now in Massachusetts, the first lunch is free. Uh, and we get reimbursed for students. We get reimbursed by the state. We get reimbursed about $4.40 per, per meal. Um, if a student were to, to ask for a second meal or what's called a la carte, so if they wanted to get an additional snack or uh, additional drink, they do need to pay for it. But it actually has really helped Newton. Um, so we now our participation has ticked up a couple of percent. And I think even just a small uh, percentage increase in participation has attracted these vendors because they know that revenue students are going to be more opted. Again, it really there really is such a thing as a free lunch right now for Massachusetts mm -hmm. students having a free lunch. And, and really our goal is really to improve the quality and, and nutrition of it. So this is a couple of more vendors than we've had in the past, yes. And uh, so uh, kids can opt into the lunch or opt not to get it. Every, and bring yep, own. they can they can opt in or, or certainly they can bring their own lunch uh, as well, correct. And what percent are, are opting in? We're approximately 31 to 32% right now. And previously we were around 28% or so that we're opting they were opting in. So we're up about 4% from where we were before. Is it, it seems low. It is low through our districts. Um, you know, we've got a number of families that uh, decide to, you know, pack their own, pack their own uh, meals. Um, um, at the high schools, we have, uh, a, you know, an open campus. Some students go out uh, to get food if they, if they so choose uh, at that lunchtime. Uh, we would like to, and that's one of our kind of some of our own benchmarks. We do want to increase that percent, um, a couple of percent each year. We want to we want to capture students uh, in Newton Public Schools to eat that food. Um, again, this is a, it's a challenging business. This is a penny's business in terms of what they can put out and that quality of the food, and that's something that we're trying to improve, you know, literally every day. But that's something that you know we've heard feedback, you know, students and from families that they want a better quality meal. We're trying to do that. We've made Amy Mistro, uh, kind of my director of operations. She's really been pushing Whitsons. They have a new director this year that's really been helping out. But um, you know, it's it is certainly an area that we want to improve on. Correct. So if if you if if companies got the um, participation rate up higher through, I guess more attractive food, would that help us financially somehow in terms of attracting bidders? Yes, I mean anything we can do. So the food services is really a, a, the the goal, and it is a self funding program. So this goes into its own food service revolving account. Uh, the operating budget does not support it with a small. We budget about $15,000 for anything that's called bad debt. So if a family ends up taking those second meals and for some reason we cannot collect that meal, uh, the operating budget actually by law has to has to supplement any bad debt uh, every year. Uh, we do our best to collect those to collect that, you know, collect those payments. But any amount that we can get, uh, any additional participation and additional revenue helps us basically reinvest back in the program. We've actually spent quite a bit of money back reinvesting in capital. Uh, pots, pans, ovens, stoves, you can imagine our equipment and particularly some of our older schools, we have some capital needs, but we've been able to actually, we've actually gone after grants. Uh, and, and again, Amy Mistro has done a fantastic job. We've been trying to basically upgrade our facilities and our kitchen facilities to the extent that we can. We've got, you know, some aged equipment, but we've actually really made uh, significant gains. So to the more, to the, the more revenue we can get, the more we can invest back into the program. And one, one more question. Um, the the whole issue of organics as a you know percent of our citywide waste it's it's a big issue when we're trying to you know in the general population re, you know do organics recycling is there um, first of all do, do kids only take the 
the food that they actually want to eat or are they just handed a whole thing and is there an incentive for the company and who bears the cost of um food waste or disposing of it is it the city uh -huh. or is it the contractor yeah all great questions so Believe it or not, the, 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 to, to, be, to be fully uh, compliant with a school lunch and that that's for us to get reimbursement, the student needs to take all those components in a meal. Uh, I believe it includes a milk, uh, a fruit, uh, a protein, and a carbohydrate. So they've got to have all those meals. So that you, your question about picking and choosing, for us to get a fully reimbursable meal, it actually has to have all those meal components uh, so that there is some some amount of waste that that you know school programs, school lunch programs have. Um, our current director, we do have some recycling programs going on that are piloting. Um, I would say generally the waste service program for the city actually covers the cost of that. Um, that's something built in. I think we need it. Robert um, can talk, you know, probably better than I can about those what those costs are. But we've really tried to the extent that we can um, minimize that. We've fully been on board in terms of the kind of some of the new uh, plastic uh, plastic recycling pieces as well. And certainly that's going to be a component that we look at. And it's one of our kind of requirements um, or, or one of our pieces that we're going to be analyzing in the bid process in terms of sustainability. But we certainly are trying to produce meals for, you know, a lot of students every day. Um, but with that, there is going to be a certain amount of waste, unfortunately. Well, I really don't like the idea of forcing kids to take food that they know they're not going to eat. But you're saying that's a state regulation? It's honestly, it's the state regulations for, for us to get a, re, it's called a reimbursable meal. And that's, um, that's something that uh, is frustrating. I know my own, my own daughters say every day that they get an apple and that they, you know, and they, they don't want the apple that, you know, so that is part of the state reimbursable meal program, unfortunately. Okay. Thank you. Interesting. Council Bixby, did you have a question? Um, so I was also going to ask about the uh, role that the um, state uh, free lunch program was playing in this. So thank you for answering that. Uh, but I also have another question, which was what what role does the variation in uh, kitchen facilities uh, between our elementary schools play in a contract like this? So um, when you ask which type of role in terms of like participation or in terms of what like quality of food that we can deliver? In terms of uh, the I mean, it, it seems like we've got a great list of, of um, potential vendors, but are they equipped to handle, you know, the schools that have no internal kitchen and the schools that have fully equipped kitchens and the variety there between our elementary schools? Yep. So when we had that, when so we had the six vendors came through and we actually took them on a tour of our schools. Um, many of us, these vendors have seen Newton already. So they have seen, we've got some, we've got some fantastic kitchens and with, you know, you know, state-of-the-art kitchens, large, full cooking facilities, and some are uh, literally a little better than closets with, you know, a, a small area for refrigerator, heating up uh, some areas, and they're even delivering food on a different floor in the building. So we have some great variability to that. The vendors have seen and are, are kind of used to that in other schools. Um, it's not ideal. It's the conditions we've got. We know we've got some buildings. And again, though, as you know, you folks know this, we've got some great new projects coming on board, Franklin, Countryside, um, Horseman's already got a, a decent kitchen already, Lincoln Elliott. These are going to be really nice kitchens. So to you know, the extent when we, we do new buildings, we're doing really nice new kitchens for these. Um, so the vendors are aware of, that, aware of that. It does have an impact on us, though, to the extent of how much we can offer, um, you know, a lot of our uh, elementary schools. A lot of the, the meals are actually prepped and, and, and made at Newton North, and we have a delivery system. So a lot of these things are actually then heated up or reheated um, if, it's a, if it's a hot meal at the elementary schools. Um, so to the extent that we can at some of our elementary schools with newer, newer facilities, um, if, they've, if we've got the staffing, we can do, for lack of a better word, more scratch cooking at those facilities than we can at some of the smaller facilities that really, really are not meant for that. All set, Council Bixby. Any other questions? Again, this is to authorize up to five years. Uh, Councillor Humphrey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be very brief. Um, I understand from a financial standpoint the rationale for the request. Um, I'll vote no, though, just because I have always been quite vocally uh, concerned about the outsourcing of this, and I understand there were reasons for doing it. I think there's also been some unintended consequences uh, for doing it this way, and um, I just you know want to be consistent again on that point. So thank you. 
Okay, anyone else? Let me just add one little piece of information. Uh, in my previous life on the school committee back in the 80s, there was a line item in the school budget to supplement, support um, food services. And it was literally hundreds of thousands of dollars. I remember there was one year, there was a line on it, it was like $600,000. And one of the things that we were determined to do at that time is to get that down to zero, which has been, you know, which was done several years ago. So, but there were other times when the schools had a, you know, um, spend a lot of money that could go to otherwise, you know, staff and so forth uh, to keep the program going. So there certainly have been uh, some improvements over the years. All right. Um, I see no additional hands. So can I get a motion to approve the item? So moved. Council Lipoff has moved approval. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Any abstentions? Motion passes by a vote of seven in favor and one in opposition, Councilor Humphrey. All right. Um, Vice Chair, Maliki, I'm going to ask um, that you take over here for a few minutes, and I okay. will be back to you. Okay. This next, the next item is one twelve dash twenty four. You all set? Okay. All Thank right. You. So one twelve twenty four. Her Honor the Mayor, requesting authorization to appropriate and expend one million one hundred ninety one thousand from June thirtieth, twenty twenty three, certified free cash to complete funding for the. In free library chiller and related cooling equipment replacement project. And uh, would this be um, who wants to do this? I'll take this one on, Counselor. Oh, no, there you are. I, I figured it was you. Couldn't quite <laughs> spot you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it, everybody. Um, so I'm going to do a, a brief recap because I know we have a few members that were not here this past summer when we came through the first time. Um, in June of 2023, um, I came before the city council requesting $750,000 of free cash uh, to go towards funding the Newton Free Library electrification HVAC upgrade project. Uh, at that time, I explained to the council that we were seeking uh, a, a pretty sizable state grant and that having some funds approved would help leverage and, and improve our case for that grant. Uh, tonight, as I explained to public facilities recently, I'm excited to announce that we have secured half a million dollars in state grant funds uh, through the uh, Green Communities Decarbonization Program. Uh, that is a direct grant. Uh, so at the same time, we put the project out to bid. Uh, those documents are in your backup. We, we received a, a significant number of bidders uh, with a pretty tight spread on the, the, the kind of bottom half. Uh, the low bidder uh, submitted a bid of uh, $2.15 million. Uh, they are very responsible, uh, have done similar projects. All of the reference checks came back great. Um, with that bid in hand, we assembled our uh, total project budget, uh, which is $2.541 million, uh, uh, backing out the $850,000 that was total approved to date, which include $100,000 approved for design, uh, and including all of the contingencies. The net ask tonight is $1.191 million. You will, the, the committee will see that there was one, uh, there was one additional letter that was submitted on my behalf uh, to the finance committee, uh, I believe on Friday. That was, uh, thank you very much to Chair Gentile who pointed out in public facilities that an erroneous uh, budget backup was included in one of our letters uh, and it, it just didn't match the original, the, the, the actual docket uh, number, nor the budget that was submitted and approved by public facilities. So uh, to clarify, I included a letter on Friday, which you'll find in your packet, just making it crystal clear uh, what the, the budget backup is for this project. Again, requesting $1.191 million. And this is to uh, replace the chillers uh, and the cooling towers. Um, as Jill Mercurio from the library mentioned at public facilities, and I have mentioned as well, uh, the system is be, uh, at the end of its useful life. And uh, it has been a struggle over the last few years to keep it going. Um, 
This is going to be very timely. It will be something that is welcomed by the uh, library staff and, of course, all the patrons. Uh, I'm happy to answer any and all questions that the committee may have. And are there any questions? I don't see any. Let's go. Oh, uh, Councilor Greenberg. Oh, thank you. Um, Commissioner Morris, in the budget that it said um, less incentive upon completion of project of $10,000, what does that mean? So I'm, I'm glad you asked that. The, uh, the utility company offers a very small rebate for this particular project. Uh, but it is not, we don't get that money until uh, significantly after we complete the project. So I couldn't, I couldn't assume that, I couldn't take that $10,000 out of the ask because I have to finish the project completely, go through closeout. Um, but that $10,000 will come in uh, and it will go to the energy stabilization account. Oh, okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, do we have a motion? I'll move approval. Okay, thank you. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that's a uh, seven to zero vote. Okay, moving on, let me get back here. Uh, Okay, uh, we could uh, take these two items together. Um, we have 106-24 to establish the NPS uh, Educational Stabilization Fund and 107-24 to appropriate, uh, her the mayor requesting authorization to appropriate from the overlay surplus, $18,200,000 uh, interest income uh, that is accumulated as part of the 18.2 million or late surplus uh, 800,000, uh, which can be allocated from free cash and the uh, June 30th, 2023 certified free cash, $3 million to the NPS stabilization fund for a total of 22 million. And um, um, Ms. Lemieux, would you like to present? Uh, thank you very much, Councillor. Um, <clears throat> I know that most of you probably know this, but um, again, for background and uh, for the record, um, the impetus uh, for our desire to set up the stabilization fund stems, stems from back at the end of fiscal 22. We had a very healthy amount of free cash that was declared. Again, in fiscal 23, we had another very healthy amount of free cash. Both of those years, it was because um, we received our, our full payment from the Eversource settlement, as well as uh, rising interest rates in fiscal uh, 22, which really increased substantially uh, in fiscal 23, and so drove those large free cash numbers. Also in conjunction with the um, payment of Eversource in August of this past year, so August of 23, the Board of Assessors declared $20.5 million as surplus overlay. At that same time, we knew we had a separate account that was set aside for the interest for um, appellate tax board cases if we were to lose. Most of that money was really dedicated to Eversource, and so we knew that we no longer needed to have that money. That account was um, $5,513,000. So between the two, uh, we ended up with just a little over $26 million. Because our free cash was so healthy in 22 and 23, we knew that we could take these overlay funds and the interest uh, money that we were not going to need and really have the opportunity to take um, a significant amount of one-time money and turn it into ongoing funds, in particular for the Newton Public Schools. Um, as you know, we came before you with two different potential stabilization funds, neither of which uh, received the approval of the board. Throughout all of these conversations in the last six months, it has always been the mayor's intent uh, to appropriate 70% 
of these overlay funds, or at least in concept, because of course we cannot appropriate funds, um, you know, and and bind a council that has not even even been seated yet. Um, so beyond fiscal twenty six. The mayor cannot control any of it unless, of course, she becomes mayor again. Uh, but for 25 and 26, we can certainly tell you what our plan is. And so the intent we've worked with, we worked with Councilor Gentile, we worked with um, the state uh, division of local services to make sure that we were uh, really getting this right coming before you. Um, we would like to set up what we are calling the NPS Educational Stabilization Fund. We have been very careful, and I know that the um, council order, I don't think, was initially attached to the agenda when it went out, but hopefully you all have that now. And just for the record, I will um, read that the purpose of the NPS Educational Stabilization Fund shall be to provide funding for educational purposes, including but not limited to faculty, staff, initiatives, programs, services, curriculum, and any such expenditures that relate to the provision of educational services by the Newton Public Schools. So um, I wanna be very clear that we tried to make this as wide sweeping as possible so that it would cover anything that NPS may want to do with the money. It is our intent to um, expend these funds probably over five years. As I said, beyond fiscal 26, the mayor can't direct any of that unless she's mayor again. Um, however, we expect that when we come forward with our budget in April, we will be up, um, allocating 3.9 million of these funds for the Newton Public Schools. Um, I know this, this first docket item is strictly to establish the fund. We need a two thirds vote to establish it. And then when we move to the next docket item, which is the one that will actually fund the fund, uh, we only need a simple majority on that. The rules have changed um, just as with uh, the item that we, uh, the opioid legislation, as part of the same group of uh, changes in the law, we now only need a simple majority to put money into this fund and a simple majority to take money out. And so that is a new development um, that was signed by the governor, I think it was November 28th. Uh, so that's, you know, late breaking news, if you will. Um, and with that, Mr. Chair, I if you want to handle just the establishment of the fund first, I can stop there. If, if you want me to talk about how we came up with the 20, 22 million, I could do that also, whatever whatever your pleasure is. So, okay. Council Maliki, if you don't oh. mind, let me jump back in. I, okay, okay, didn't realize you were back. Welcome no, back. Thank, thank you. you. So um, I'd like to take them one at a time, uh, Maureen, you know, starting with 106-24. I also want to point out that our city treasurer, Ron Mendez is here with us tonight. So if you have any questions about, you know, where are these funds now? Um, what kind of a return are they getting? Um, or any question, any, any question like that over these next several items, um, please feel free, you know, to ask Mr. Mendez and, you know, he can share with you that information. So, um, are you all set at least with explaining 106-24, Maureen? Uh, I believe so. The only um, point I will make, I know it's in the letter, I think it's in the council order also, that any funds that reside in this account will uh, earn interest and the interest will be returned to the account. So that's a really important point. Right. And so, again, this requires, just so you know, uh, Maureen already said it, but I just want to emphasize to establish the fund takes a two thirds vote. Um, as far as appropriating more money to it, but more importantly, um, getting money out of it to spend takes only a majority vote. Okay. Questions on 106 24. And I believe that Programs and Services has already taken this up and approved it, correct? We did. Okay. Um, questions on 106-24, the establishment of the stabilization fund. If there are 
But no questions. Um, why don't we get a motion to um, get that? Oh, sorry, Councilor Bixby. So um, being new, uh, can you explain a little bit the difference? You know, previously the funds had more set allocations year by year. Um, and this one does not, you said you hoped to, you know, or plan to allocate 3.9 this year and some amount next year, but could you just explain a little bit about the differences and how that relates to us? Uh, thank you, actually. Thank you very much for that because our thought process has really evolved over the last six months, um, you know, primarily with input from the city councilors. So when we first, the first, um, thought process that we had was that we would uh, put 70% of the overlay funds into a stabilization fund and we would um, appropriate it to the schools, but our intent was to have the money last for eight years. We have eight more budgets that we have to prepare before we hope that we will have our pensions fully funded when we can really have transformative change in how we budget for the public schools. We were going to start off with a fairly small amount um, in that eight-year plan and have it grow and grow and grow, go all the way through 2032, and then, um, as I say, have an infusion of funds for the schools once we had fully funded our pensions. For several reasons, um, members of the council did not like that plan. So we went back to the drawing board. And we came back in November, I think it was, um, looking to set up a debt service stabilization fund. And at that point in time, we were going to put all of the funds, uh, all of this money in that fund, I believe. And uh, we would have used the funds to pay down debt service so that we could free up money that otherwise would have gone to debt service to help with the Newton Public Schools operating budget. That also um, met with a lot of uh, questions and, and um, you know, people, a lack of support, if I may say that. As time has gone on, we have now settled the contract. Our new superintendent has had the time to create her entry plan. She's had time to really look at um, the district as a whole and figure out what she thinks she needs in the immediate term. And so we've had, we've gained, um, I would say over the last three months, even much more clarity on what it is that the school department needs. And so, um, as I say, so our intent would be to take this money. And so that's why you will see when we bring our budget forward uh, in the spring, you will see, um, I expect the number will be 3.9 million of these funds is what we will uh, set aside for the schools for next year. So it's very different, you know, from what we were thinking back in our first iteration in August. We also, our superintendent, um, I, I believe probably many of you have heard uh, her say that she believes she can find efficiencies in the school department. Um, she is, you know, really looking at how we do everything. Um, after you've had a superintendent for a long time, it's always good to have a fresh set of eyes. People can always look at things differently. And so um, Superintendent Nolan is convinced that she will be able to find savings so that when this money, if it is over five years that we use it, it would that would go out through fiscal 29. We still have three more years where we're, um, you know, ramping up with the pension funding. Um, hopefully we will not have a financial cliff. Hopefully she will have found efficiencies. If not, we still have five years where we can plan for that. We'll know what's going on. We'll be able to figure out what we need to do and what the right next next steps are. Um, so that's how it really it it really changes. It was always the intent to give seventy percent of the money to the schools. It's just that um, it has completely changed, and we've really front loaded much more of it than we initially thought that uh, we were going to. Thank you. And so, just to be very clear for ourselves and you know those interested in this, uh, the each year the the mayor sets the requests for this fund but it, it does have to go to newton public schools uses no matter the amount requested or the specifics of that each year 
The only thing that would um, change that is if, um, I'm not sure if the mayor would have to propose it or if you as a council could propose it, but it would require a two thirds vote of the council to change the purpose of this fund. Otherwise it can't even be changed by a simple majority. Got it. Thank you. Okay, Councilor Greenberg. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, just to be clear, Ms. Lemieux, the 22 million is 70% of the 26 million plus the interest that was earned in the overlay fund? Yes, so I think I'm gonna, I think once we take, once you all take this vote, um, I think I'm gonna go into details on the 22. So this is not for the 22 million yet, this is strictly to establish the fund. Okay. The next item will be us actually putting money into the fund. Okay. Um, I was just trying to figure out the numbers with the 70% of 26 million. Um, and then my other question, not, you know, to play the devil's advocate, if you don't get the 20, the two thirds vote of the city council to create this fund, mm -hmm. will that put a rent, a monkey wrench into the contract with the teachers or what will happen? So uh, thank you. That's another great question. So not for this mayor and not for these next two years. Um, this mayor will appropriate whether there's a stabilization fund or if the money is sitting still as an overlay surplus or if it lands in free cash. Mayor Fuller is going to um, come to you when she brings the budget forward. Uh, as I say, probably, I don't want to say 3.9 um, ab as absolute, uh, but it'll be in that range. And then next year, it would be our intent to have another amount that is similar in size to that. We can control, the, and I want to hate to say, we can control that even if it's in free cash, which is where it would all the money would drop to. Um, of course, we would need your approval to actually appropriate the funds. The thing that we would lose is that this fund with the 22 million that we're looking to put in it um, by next week or whenever the actual vote would be, all the interest that it earns is going to go right back into the fund. So all the interest is guaranteed to go back to the schools. If it's not, if the money is not in a stabilization fund, um, the interest has to go to the general fund. Now, you were not on finance last term. We certainly had conversations that, you know, we could bring forward a docket item asking you to move a certain amount of interest income into the stabilization or into uh, whatever fund we would uh, be having these funds sit in if we didn't have a stabilization fund, but it would just really muddy the waters. If that makes okay. sense. I think I rambled a bit. No, I I think I understand. So even if we don't, the city council doesn't approve this fund, the mayor still has a plan to fulfill the first, these next two years in the yes. budget. Of the, yes. Okay. All right. Got it. Thank you. And if I, if I, can I just, we'll obviously make this very clear when we get to the budget process, but um, these funds, when when we uh, um, come forward with the $3.9 million, not all of this money is going to the contract. Um, money is going toward the um, really important initiatives that the superintendent uh, wants to make sure uh, gets included in, in what they accomplish next year. So we'll be very explicit when we bring the budget forward. Council Humphrey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I asked basically all my questions in the programs and services round on this item. Um, I think it was important to hear the point that was just reiterated earlier that there was a change in state law that, in my opinion, makes any stabilization fund a more attractive prospect than it had been last year because there were some procedural issues that were very concerning uh, to me and others. Um, I'm also glad that, again, the plan, at least in theory, since we can't really bake it in, is is for a higher amount of money up front and then a shorter time frame in general. Um, I think that was responsive to a lot of the concerns that were raised last year. Um, as I said in programs and services, I, I you know, aside from the state law change that happened in November, I do wish that we could have been having that kind of a conversation 
toward what we ha have now ended up with here. And I wish we could have been having that last year because I think there was a lot of interest in figuring out a deal that made sense to people. And this is pretty similar, um, especially on the NPS specific stuff to what a number of us had floated at various points in various configurations last year. And I just wish that that had been a more productive and less confrontational discussion last year because we're ending up here anyway. And in my opinion, this is basically fine at this point. So thank you. Councilor Grossman. Thank you. I just wanted to say that I supported this concept early on. I support it now. I'm happy to see us move forward regardless of the process we went through and who contributed what to that process. Uh, I'm happy that we're in a position to move forward now and I strongly support this effort. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to add one thought. Um, first of all, I uh, support the creation of this stabilization fund. I had suggested it um, myself recently. I believe it's um, makes all the sense to set it up. Um, I, I want to just emphasize a point that Maureen made, which is it is important for us to understand the plan, but I think it's also extremely important for us to recognize and acknowledge that our budgeting process is a process that we go through on an annual basis and things change. So I, it's clear to me that this upcoming budget, we're, we're gonna see a request for approximately $3.9 million to come out of this fund to supplement the school department's budget. And um, I appreciate knowing that and I'm supporting that based on what I know at this point, but that's all that I am personally committing to because next year is a new year. And I know that the plan is to see um, a similar appropriation. And I would expect that there'll be good reason to support it but I also have been around long enough to know that things change and it's a big city with a lot of different needs. And, um, um, you know, the, the appropriation request next year might be the same, might be a little less, could be even be more, but I think it's important that we as a finance committee, um, keep in mind that, you know, the budget process is, is new every year and we need to let the process move forward and make the best decisions that we can um, at that time. So um, again, I'm, I'm committing to uh, what's already been clearly um, expressed to us by Maureen, by, you know, at, on behalf of the mayor. Um, and I'm, you know, I know what we're gonna see in, uh, in this budget cycle. And then again, Next year is next year. So um, are there any questions just on this item of establishing the fund? Um, seeing, now, seeing none, can I get a motion to establish the um, NPS Educational Stabilization Fund, which is docket 106-24? So moved. All right, Council Grossman has moved approval. Uh, seeing no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. The motion passes uh, unanimously, eight to zero. So let's move on to 107-24. Um, Maureen, if I may, just exp I would suggest that you just explain the additional $3 million of free cash, because then the money, as, as Council Greenberg says, it's a little tricky as to how the money adds up, you know, the 70%, whatever. So it, the answer, as you know, is the $3 million in free cash. So why don't we explain that? And, and we can vote. Okay. And the so interest. And the interest. I and get the it. interest. Right. And so 26 million was our starting point. 70% of 26 million is 18.2. Along the way, so that has been our number that we've been 
trying to figure out all these months how we get to a place where that money gets set aside for the schools. Along the way, um, between the different um, initiatives that the superintendent would like to accomplish, as well as um, the contract negotiations, the mayor committed to taking another $3 million of free cash and um, giving that to the schools. The school department um, doesn't necessarily need that money this year, and, and they're going to figure out what they're going to do with that. We've had conversations, Liam and I, um, and I presume, although I know he just got back from vacation today, um, but I'm sure the school committee, the school administration will have conversations, and that's why I didn't want to commit to the 3.9. We'll certainly want to make sure that we understand how we um uh, appropriate, if you will, the free cash. But that was something that uh, we concluded um, throughout the negotiation process. And then um, I took the 18.2 million. If we, we have been earning about five and a half percent interest over the course of this year. And so I applied nine months worth of interest because it will be the end of March by the time we get this set up. Um, it was uh, seven, I think 750, 760, 770, something in that range. And so I rounded up to $800,000 so that we would have a nice round number. And so at this point, what we're asking for is to put 22 million in the fund. 18.2 is the 70%. 800,000 is the interest that that would have earned had it been in a stabilization fund from the get-go this fiscal year, and then 3 million of free cash. Okay, any questions? I think the numbers are clear. I'd be happy to take a vote on this if everybody's fine. Oh, uh, Steve, go right ahead. Thanks. I just want to make a clarifying comment that the $800,000, which is interest earned, is being allocated from free cash. So the full appropriation from free cash is $3.8 million. You agree with that, Maureen? Uh, yes, and actually, um, because we can't appropriate um, interest that we are earning this year, interest that's sitting in revenue and hasn't gone through our full accounting process, we can't appropriate it. So we're taking it out of what was our free cash declared um, in June of 23. All right. So how about if I ask for an amendment to um, to remove the 800000 Oh, it is. It does, say, yeah, which, it, it it's, does say free cash. Yes. And it's in the council order. It shows it as 3.8 million from free cash. Okay. All but right. That's, I just want to make sure you all understood how we got right. there. I, so then I don't really need to ask for any amendment. Council Bixby. I'll just uh, going off mute. Um, can you just, so, you know, I know the, the overlay surplus 70% has been a part of the conversation for a while. Um, when did the three million enter the conversation publicly? Um, between mid December and settlement of the contract, and I can't really narrow it down. It it came in um, bits and pieces. I, I want to say at least one million of it was probably back in December, um, and I'm not. I honestly can't remember. Uh, you know, as that number grew to three. Got it. Thanks. I think it would, you know, it could be helpful for people just to kind of understand. I know there's a lot of, you know, outstanding questions about kind of all those money conversations over the uh, past month or so. So, you know, that might be helpful over time, although not necessary for this vote. C Council Bixby, I think part of the answer to your question is there really hasn't been a lot of public discussion about that three million. Um, but I think the good news is it really gets the fund off to a very healthy start because, again, we're making, as as Maureen said, and I'm sure Mr. Mendez could could uh, back up, we're getting like five and a half percent of the money. So that'll be that'll be extra money that will go back into the fund, you know, from the interest income earned. For sure. I think I think this is great. I'm I'm excited about it. I just think, you know, with the outstanding questions about funding and all of that, it could be helpful, but so I think it's great. Would you like to make a motion to approve the item? 
I would love to make a motion. I'm sorry, my um, NPS students were attempting to join the meeting as well. <laughs> um, I move to approve uh, the funding of the stabilization fund. Do I need to say the? That's it. Thanks. Enough. All right. Any other questions, comments? All right. All those in favor of 107-24, please say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. aye. Any opposed? Um, any abstentions? Okay, motion passes unanimously, eight to zero. All right, two more items. Uh, top of page three, 109-24, per honor the mayor requesting authorization to appropriate and expend a total of $7.8 million for the new Cal project to reduce the amount of funding the city would need to borrow for that project. The 7.8 million is comprised of two funding sources related to the Eversource agreement. 5,500,000 transferred from the ATB interest and penalties account and 2,300,000 uh, from overlay surplus. As a result, I am also requesting authorization to rescind 7.8 million of the bond authorization for the new Cal project. So in addition to that, Maureen, I expect that you will be talking about bands and explaining that to the committee so that people have a full picture of what the plan is. I am happy to. All right. Uh, so this is where our meeting gets interesting tonight. There's um, a lot that's happening. Um, so the simple fact of the... Um, docket item that's in front of you, the the uh, the way that we came to those two sums of money is that's the other 30% that's left over. We've talked about the 26 million really all as one amount all along, but it's actually in two accounts. So it was 20.5 of overlay surplus and 5.5 of interest. 30% of the 26 million is $7.8 million. So this was the 30% that, that, that we were going to put toward um, city infrastructure, if you will. Um, we are currently in the process of selling our bonds, but when we, we talk about selling bonds, but there are really, um, I would say four components, and this is kind of also gonna, um, slide a bit into the next item that's going to be before you. We can sell, we sell bonds. That is our um, permanent way of funding our investments. And so really that's our long-term strategy is ultimately we sell bonds. We sell bands, if, um, which are short-term instruments if we want to. If we sell bands, we only have to pay the interest back in the following year. We can sell bands uh, for two years, I believe, and this is where Mr. Mendez will be able to correct me for anything I say that's incorrect. Um, and But after two years, you have to bond that eventually anything that we build, we have to get on track with paying back the principal. So we don't pay principal back when we're selling bands. We um, have cash sometimes that we contribute to a project so that we can manage what our annual debt service number is in our operating budget. And the fourth strategy that we have used um, and saved probably saved more than uh, $20 million in the last decade is we have gone out and we have refunded our bonds. It used to, that's the same thing as refinancing your own mortgage. It used to be that we could do what was called an advance refunding. When the tax laws changed in 2017, we were no longer able to, we weren't able to go out and do an advance refunding anymore. And so we haven't been doing any of those for the last six or seven years. But those are really the four different things that we do. I want to talk about NuCal for a minute. So now understanding we finance things all different ways. New Cal, um, we actually, we sold a bond, or actually, let me say before that, when once we got our ARPA funds, um, the mayor allocated $500,000 of ARPA funds to jumpstart our new Cal design. As you know, everything once March, 20, March of 2020 got here, 
everything was put on hold. And so once we had the ARPA funds, we jump started the design again of New Cal. So we had a half a million dollars there. Last year, we bonded another $3 million for New Cal. When you approve a project, you approve a project, but we don't sell the bonds. Um, the year that you approve a project. For most of our construction projects, it takes us anywhere from two, three to four years to end up lining up all of the debt that we have for any particular project. Um, mm. And so last year we sold 3 million bonds. So as of today, we have three and a half million dollars that we have um, secured as financing, if you will, for NuCal. We are going to spend um, about $19.5 million uh, between now and the end of next February in total on NuCal. We have worked with our financial advisors. We've worked with Councilor Gentile, um, the, the Steve Curley, myself, Perry Rosenfield, Ron Mendez. We've spent hours at this point uh, with our financial advisors, really trying to figure out how we structure everything and how we, um, as a city, benefit from the fact that we are earning um, about five and a half percent in our very safe investments. And so Ron can certainly, we can jump to him in a minute. So um, we are going to go out and sell a ban for a little over 15 million for NuCal when we sell our bonds in the next few weeks. A year from now, we would sell, so that's only a band. So you have to actually turn it into a bond at some point. A year from now, we would turn it into a bond with the extra few million dollars that we would need for the project. At the very end, we will have this $7.8 million, if you approve this, that will have been sitting uh, waiting in the wings, if you will, earning interest. Now, the interest will go to the general fund. It's not going to go to grow our $7.8 million. But if you think about it, the $7.8 million is going to earn five, even if rates go down to four or four and a half, it's going to earn substantial interest over the next year. Um, so our new Cal project, when all is said and done, we will have put to jumpstart it, to get it going. We will have sold the bond a year ago to get money for our design work. We will be selling a $15 million ban um, next month because our sale will actually be in March. We will be converting that $15 million ban into a $19 million bond a year from now. And then we will have $7.8 million of cash that we will use for the end of the project. Would you like me to stop there, Councillor Gentile? You're muted. I think that that is an excellent place to stop and see if there are um, any questions at this point. Council Humphrey, your hand is up, I believe. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So. Could you clarify about the decision process on cash versus bonding on the extra amount? Because we had previously, not that long ago, approved additional bonding to cover the additional amount. And I had raised the question at the time as to whether we should be doing it that way or should be doing it through cash. Not that I was taking a definitive position on that myself, but just that I was posing the question given the discussion we had mm -hmm. had around Lincoln Elliott. So I was wondering if you could clarify, because it seems like we started to go in one direction and then changed our minds to go in the other direction. I was wondering what the timeline on that was and what made the decision. So it's actually, uh, thank you, because that's a good question. It's not, and I think I've frozen on my screen, but I'm hoping you can hear me. Yeah, we yeah. can hear you. Okay. We can hear you. Okay. Um, it's not unusual for us to bond to seek a bond authorization from the council, even if we choose to do something else. Um, when every project that we do that MSBA is involved in, we have to get an authorization for the full amount of the project, knowing, so Countryside, you have approved the full cost of the school. It's Countryside, right, that MSBA is in? Yes. 
Yes. Okay. So you have approved the full value of the bonding for that project. We won't bond. Um, we'll receive anywhere between 15 and $20 million from MSBA for that project. So we will bond almost 20 million less than you have authorized. Um, and eventually, which is a few years from now, uh, we will come back to you and have you rescind that authorization. Um, we came to you a few years ago, or it's probably a year and a half or so ago, and um, I asked for you to give us a bond authorization for the meter replacement program. And we were going to use half of the money from uh, water and half of it from sewer. As time has gone on, we have um, very healthy reserves in each of those two accounts that there is a good chance that we will end up paying cash for those because I can't I can't um, impact the annual operating revenue stream for those accounts, but I certainly don't want to have more cash than we need in the bank in those accounts. That's money that people have paid for their utilities. So it's not uncommon for us to come to you. We weren't at a place, um, several months ago where we really um, finally had clarity on how we were going to spend all of this money with us coming to you. And, and we, you know, we know that we knew that there were um, many members of the council who we were expecting to support the NPS stabilization fund. And so now we were at the point where we really could take a look at the 7.8 and figure out what we do with it. Um, we actually toyed with the idea of taking that money and much as we are doing with the school money and more or less appropriating it over five years, we talked about doing something like that. And so um, I would say it's probably only in the last three weeks, probably not more than three weeks, could be four weeks, that we um, pivoted and decided that uh, we really felt that it would be a better choice to take the 7.8 and use it to pay down um, uh, or to pay cash toward new Cal as we put in the memo at three and a half percent. I think the number was um, about $420,000 that that would add to our, um, our debt service for each year of the next 30 years. The difference with this is, excuse me, when we're making this decision, um, we're not coming to you saying that we want to reappropriate the 7.8 million and buy something else or build something else. This is really going to help us with our operating budget as we're moving forward. So, so I, I hope that helps you. So these things all, you know, a lot of these things don't happen overnight. They really become an iterative process. Right. So I understand the rationale. I think I do have some concerns here still because, um, well, so what you're, you've talked about the debt service that would be freed up. What are you planning to, or roughly, what are you planning to do with that now that it's freed up? Oops, I think we lost her. M Mr. Chair, I do have a few more relatively short questions when she gets okay. back on. Well, <clears throat> hopefully she'll be back on. Um, what I was going to ask um, Maureen to do is to also share with you, uh, we get obviously, we, the city, does not make these decisions in a vacuum. And right. we have um, folks that advise us. Yeah. And um, I thought it would be helpful because I think that Cinda um who has been advising the city for a number of years um did play somewhat of a role in in how this is turning out and being recommended and i would i wanted uh, maureen you know to talk about that a little bit the other thing is the way the reason that um we started to discuss this is just simply the numbers we were told that we could expect to be able to um being um, a certain amount of money um, at a rate in the low to mid threes. And we all know that right now, 
um, we're getting five and a half percent interest on the cash that we have. So it just seemed logical, you know, to see if what we might want to do, um, seeing that the spread was in our favor by, you know, a solid 2%. I think that's another reason why, you know, the discussion went in this direction. Um, let me do this. Um, let me just put you on hold for a minute until more, because I think mm -hmm. the other questions that you have are probably for Maureen. So yeah, yeah, they were all, yeah. All right. the, me, some some of it I understand and some of it, you know, I just wanted to at least get some clarity. Okay. Let me, Ron's uh, got his hand up. So let's hear from him. Go ahead, Ron. Uh, sure. I mean, the only the the there was the some internal discussion that took place to decide to do the bond anticipation note as opposed to permanently borrowing for these these uh, the projects the the countryside and the um, the I believe it's the Franklin School and um, and we and and uh, the the chairman just spoke about the difference between the interest we can earn the five and a half percent that we think we can earn uh, by borrowing that money and putting it in the bank versus the three or three and a quarter percent that we will pay out on the band. So we that that arbitrage um, differential that we can make on that, that two and a half, that two percent is is additional interest income the city could keep. Whereas if we just spent down, uh, you know, using uh, cash on um, on those projects, we would not earn that money. But and we would also lose investment income because we wouldn't have that money in the bank it would be spent on those projects. So it's it's a way of trying to benefit, um, you know, in terms of using these different uh, ways of borrowing money uh, to earn some money for the city. There are some limitations on arbitrage that we can earn. Yeah. Uh, so we, we can earn that 2%, but we have to make sure that projects are spent down on a time, on a timeline that the IRS mandates. So uh, in the case of building project has to be spent down at certain intervals, six months, uh, it has to be uh, uh, 25%. And then by by the end of two years, it has to be completely spent. Um, if you don't adhere to those timelines, then you basically have to give that arbitrage over to the IRS. And we want to avoid that, um, which is why the ban is a little bit more um, appealing in this particular case, because it allows us to control the interest that we're earning, uh, the interest rate that we're earning, but also uh, to time things out a little better with the with the way the project ends up um, um, being uh, spent down so that we don't run into that project if there are any unexpected delays in the project timeline. I see Maureen's back. I don't know if uh, she wants to jump back in. Maureen, can you hear um, us okay? I, I can hear you and I can see you. And I'm happy that you continued without me. Um, I kept talking. I had no idea. <laughs> So Maureen, um, Maureen, Maureen, one thing I was hoping and I explained to the co committee while you were gone, one thing I wanted you to do is to come back and talk a little bit about, you know, the advice that we get, maybe, you know, tell people who Cinder is, her role. I think that maybe she had um, a little bit of a role in getting us to take a look, another look at this. So if you could just quickly explain Cinder and her role, the company and so forth. So we use um, our financial advisor. Uh, her name is Cinder McNerney. Uh, she is with Hilltop Securities. Um, I would like to say I believe she is probably the foremost um, municipal financial advisor when it comes to structuring debt. Um, I have personally been working with her for 30 years. I worked with her in Nashua. Um, when I got to Newton, I was actually quite thrilled that um, that Newton used uh, their services also. And just by um, by happenstance, uh, is she on the board of selectmen, Ron, for Swampscott? Uh, she's actually, I, I was in Swampscott before I came to Newton, and uh, Cinder is on the finance committee uh, in, okay. um, in Swampscott, so she's on this committee in Swampscott. She is, I dare say she is probably the most brilliant person I have ever met uh, when it comes to um, setting up financing structures. Um, so we did talk to her and initially we started with, well, um, perhaps we ought to be looking at this 7.8 million and then the 10 million, which I'm more than happy to talk about too, if you want um, fairly quickly, 
that we are planning on using as cash for Lincoln Elliott. So we started looking at those two sums and saying, well, we ought to use the two of them at the end of the project instead of initially at this point, because um, we can take that money. So it's really between the two of them, it'll be um, almost $18 million that we will have that will be earning money rather than using our money up front. In addition oh, okay. to that, so, and then in addition to that, we've got the whole cash flow laid out by month with what um, Josh Morse and his team expects to spend. So we start with um, for New Cal, uh, when I went through all the different numbers in the beginning, I'm sure you d probably don't remember, but we're going to sell 15 million for bands for New Cal. It's going to take us the better part of the next year to s actually spend that 15 million. So we'll be able to invest that money also. Now, some of it needs to go back to paying the interest. We will have a large interest bill due next March, but our the the net difference between what we're going to be paying on the bands and what we're going to be earning on the bands is all going to drop to free cash for us with Lincoln Elliott just so that you can understand so this is a, a, a much bigger conversation even than just um new cal in the 7.8 million we have gone through the same structure and the same process for Lincoln Elliott and so we are going to sell a ban for 35 million for Lincoln Elliott. We have 10 million that you've approved that we will use as cash at the end of that project. And so we will again uh, earn a significant amount of interest on those funds, but complying with everything that we have to do so that we don't get into an arbitrage um, position where we have to pay back money because these are two very fast moving projects. And so it was from working with, um, excuse me, particularly our, our um, financial advisors, having them run different schedules for us, having us really, really take a hard look at this um, and make sure that we were comfortable with what we were doing. Um, so, so this was another thing that was, um, as I think I've said it now three different times on three different answers, this was another thing that really was an iterative process. This is the first time that I, that I have ever, um, thought that selling bands of this magnitude, um, was the right decision for us, but it really is. It isn't, it's not usual that our money can earn much more, uh, than we are paying in debt. Right. So you uh, had, okay. Council Humphrey, I think you said you had a couple more quick questions. Yes. Yeah, so so this was helpful, the, the last few answers here. Um, I don't think you had sent us that schedule you were just talking about, about from Josh Morris, about when he was expecting to be paying for certain things. And I think that would maybe help me follow along a little better because of the point you just made about this being that we're going to use our own cash at the end rather than the beginning, which I think is what I had in mind and maybe is what you had in mind previously. Because yes. I think that does make a difference here. So so it, so when we're talking about using the cash on whether it's this or the Lincoln Elliott one, how are we now going to be using it versus what we were going to previously be using? Is it is it in fact be, related to these bands as opposed to like just paying for whatever? Absolutely. It's 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 all about the bands. Okay. So we'll do 15 for New Cal and 35 for Lincoln Elliott. That will sit in um, the accounts wherever obviously Steve and Ron can give you those answers right. better than I can. But every night um, our money is all swept. Any Anything that isn't actually in an instrument is swept and our money then earns interest, you know, as a pool if you will. So whatever we still have of the bands sitting in the bank, if you will, before we've spent it, we'll be earning interest all along the way. Some of that interest will go toward paying um, the interest on the bands. So the first right. three and a quarter or whatever percent we earn in the next year um, will go toward paying down the bands. But then beyond that, the interest will accumulate in our interest income account. Okay. So previously, if we had not embarked on this particular plan, how would you have been using the cash so, instead? 
so if we had not done this, um, what my thought would have been is that I thought that we would use the cash first because um, what I didn't want to do was sell too much in bonds um, too soon if we are all hoping that borrowing rates will go down in the next year. So right, because, yeah. and this goes back to what I, when I uh, earlier alluded to the refunding, we can't refund now for 10 years. So if we sell bonds and then the rates go down next year, if they plummet next year, we can't do anything. We have to live with that higher rate for um, almost 10 years. And then we could refund it. Whereas when you flip the bands into the longer term bonds, that's going to be at a lower rate if the rates hopefully. have gone down. Hopefully. hopefully. Right. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. That could exactly. happen in a year. That could happen in two years. Right. Right. And okay. You have that flexibility. Yeah. Okay. All right. This is starting to make more sense to me than it initially looked without the background information on what was going on here yeah. and how we were planning to deploy it. Um the, if if I can just, something? Council yeah. Humphrey, if I can just interrupt you just so I uh, get one more thought out there. In addition to everything that we've just said, what we typically do when we're building a project, we spend our own money on the project initially. We more right. or less front the money. So between now and next February or whenever we would be selling our bonds next year, we would have spent, um, say, $15 million on NuCal. So maybe 7.8 would have come from our cash. And then the another seven and a half would have come from just our cash flow. And so that money wouldn't be earning interest either. And now because we're doing the ban, that money will be earning interest. Okay. Um, so I the, the question that I had been in the process of asking when you uh, froze earlier was just that when you mentioned the 400 some odd thousand freed up in debt service per year, what is it that you're currently at least anticipating that that would be redeployed for elsewhere in the budget? Oh, oh, uh, thank you. So I didn't know where it was that I froze. Yeah. Um, we are not planning on redeploying it. I, I need to find savings in our projected expenses and I need to find more revenue than I ever project, you know, in any given year as we're projecting further out. I, you know, I'm conservative over the years. So that will, um, in a sense, drop to our bottom line. But we're going to okay. have all this other interest that we're earning. We're doing all kinds of, you know, this will be financially very beneficial for the city. So the, yeah, the the reason I asked that was just because when we had the Lincoln Elliott discussion last year, you had a very specific, clear idea that that savings was going to go to NPS. And I wasn't necessarily suggesting that I had something in mind for this, but just that I was curious as to whether there was any sort of specific plan here. And I think a related question there is that I am just I am still a little bit concerned about, you know, taking a large block of money from the sort of remaining amount, what's left in the overlay uh, surplus and kind of using it all in one thing, even if we can see the financial logic for this as opposed to like we've we have had lots of discussions about various other sort of infrastructure maintenance projects things like that there are probably quite a few big ticket items there that wouldn't necessarily be things we would or could bond so then it's worth at least asking that question even if you can make you know, a financial argument for this specific project of doing it this way we also have more options on this project compared to some of the other things that you know, we might need to pay cash for. We, um, so. If I might, if I might interrupt for a minute, I see other hands and I'd like to try and let some other folks, but if you want to quickly respond, but I'd like no, to okay. give, I'm good. give other people an opportunity to, uh, to maybe ask another question or two. Are we good for right now? At least we can come yes, back. Yes, you can come back to me. Thank you. Uh, Council Bixby, did you have a question? That was actually the gist of my question as well. I mean, I just trying to figure out, you know, this, it seems like a creative instrument. This is, you know, the first time we're hearing all of these pieces. So it's a lot to to process. Um, and, you know, my question with things like this is always what is at the, what, what are the alternatives? And so if we don't have a clear plan for that 420,000 each year, um, you know, and then it'll just go back to the city 
will it then end up rolling over into free cash for next year? And, you know, will that free cash be doing something else? Um, you know, is, is one question. And I think, you know, what Councillor Humphrey was asking is, you know, what, what else could be done in this moment, you know, that was, that was weighed against this plan. So, so okay. if I, if I, if I may just really quickly, the, so um, what I'm saying is that by us not spending this 420, it, it, um, helps us to be able to meet our commitment of saying to the schools that we're going to appropriate an extra 3.5% each year. For us to make those commitments, I need to find savings in what we have as a forecast. Okay. Um, I had one question. It's off topic a little bit, but it, this is really, I'm asking this of Steve Curley, Ron Mendez, and Maureen, well, you mentioned past bonding authorizations and the need from time to time to rescind those. How are we making sure that a situation like that, where we should have rescinded a previous bonding authorization, how are we making sure that that nothing is falling through the cracks? Is there one person that's primarily responsible? I, I could I could answer that. There is a there's a report that I'm required to file every year with the state uh, Department of Revenue as part of the it's one of the required reports reports in order for us to get our free cash. And Mr. Curley um, also signs off on the report. It's called us annual statement of indebtedness. And one of the sections in that actually lists all the uh, bond authorizations that are outstanding and okay. what still needs to be um, um, rescinded if, if there's a project that is complete. So uh, I don't know if Mr. Curley or, or Ms. Lemieux want to uh, expound on that, but that is an annual report that we file every year with the State Department of Revenue that reconciles those numbers uh, to the penny. So you're extremely comfortable that we're not missing you know, rescinding an authorization that should be rescinded. Because I can understand why we would get into that situation. I Maureen explained, you know, how sometimes you ask for uh, bond authorizations that you don't end up needing, which I get. But I just want to make sure that there aren't some out there floating around that for whatever reason, uh, we have not been asked to, you know, rescind either the entire amount or the amount that we did not end up bonding. And you it sounds so, to me that you folks are pretty convinced that we're on top of it. Mm -hmm. uh, Maureen, the, do you want to? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll start. Um, on the comptroller's page, there is so much information on our comptroller's page. But one of the reports, if you go into the what's new section, um, Steve does a um, authorized but unissued debt report every I don't know if you do it every quarter or six months or whatever, um, but that's where, so he tracks um, every, everything that has been authorized by the board that is unissued. And we actually, uh, we didn't want to, we were ready to bring it forward. In fact, um, right about now, we had first initially thought that we would bring the next list forward to you before we got into the budget, but because we had all these complicated docket items in front of you, we've decided we're gonna wait until June, but we will be coming, we look at that list all the time. And so for the service school, it's not that we didn't need it because of MSBA, but it's because um, Josh brought that building in under budget. You'll see we'll be rescinding um, the day and the Bigelow boilers because they were part of the MSBA um, maintenance program. And so again, anytime MSBA is involved, we have to get the whole thing authorized, knowing that we're not going to bond it all. So Bigelow and Day are on there, services on there. And there's another, I don't know, Perry. Like, or Like $3,700 for early childhood that hasn't been received. Um, so we go through and we, we we try to sweep those accounts every uh, year or two so that you know we don't have uh, money just languishing out there. Okay. Yeah. And so just to ahead, explain Steve. a little bit on that is um, so again these are authorizations and so when we determine that these projects are done I can put controls on the account so they're not spent so we don't have to worry about 
that figure that is authorized but unissued being spent without having any bond proceeds for that money. Okay. And so there's controls in place on that respect where none of these unissued authorizations that are old are being spent. All right. Are we um, are we ready to uh, vote on the item? Okay. Well, I don't know if my question did get answered earlier. Which one? The the last one that I asked about. Um, you know that this is a large cash item for one specific thing, and we have more flexibility on this particular item even if this narrowly in isolation makes sense as a financial choice, it might not make sense if we're looking at other things that we might need to be spending cash on. So I was hoping to get an answer on that. Um, you know, because there, there are other things that come up, whether they're maintenance or settlements or whatever comes up that you would not be bonding for because those are cash projects. And if we've spent down the cash, then I wonder what happens. So I'm just curious as to the cost benefit analysis here. Uh, so, so I will say to you, um, we are pretty certain that we will end up with a substantial amount of free cash again next year because the interest rates have stayed high. Um, as I've explained several times to people, um, having high interest rates for a year or two cannot translate into us adding funds to an operating budget. And so the best thing that we can do is take that free cash. Um, once it's declared in September, we certainly intend to take another hard look at the school department as well as our city departments. And um, much like we did with that, uh, it was a little over 5 million, I think that we had for the many different projects in the school department. I don't know what the number will be next year, uh, but we're certainly already working on what should that next tranche of um, building maintenance projects look like. So uh, we're always thinking about uh, what ought to be the next thing that we spend money on and how best to really deploy everything that we have. Okay, we all set. Um... Can we? Uh, can I get a motion then on docket item one hundred nine dash twenty four, please? Okay. Councillor Maliki, are you making the motion? Uh, I just, I just wanted to ask um, the the whole arbitrage thing. It seems like magic free money, and uh, what is the downside? It seems like it's predicated on the assumption that we'll get a better long term bond rate in a couple of years than if we bonded now. But what happens if we're wrong? That's the downside. Yeah. I mean, we would never we would never um sell bands just to create a positive interest rate environment. We need we need to spend um this money on these two projects. So um hopefully hopefully rates will not be higher. If they are the same as, as where they are now, we won't have lost. If they're better, we'll have won. If they're higher, um, I don't know that we would want to. We'll certainly you know, discuss this at that point in time. But if they were higher, we would have the potential of selling bands for one more year. Um, you know, If we roll the dice and lose this, and it's not going to be by a huge amount but if we if if they were a little higher next year um we would need to really spend some time with our financial advisors and figure out what we ought to do we could sell the bands for one more year okay anyone else um can i get a motion then on the stock item i'll move right. approval all right, Council Greenberg has moved approval of 109-24. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, any opposed? Abstention. I'd like to I abstain. One, I see one abstention. Was that also That's you, two, Council Two Bixby? abstentions. Yeah. Council Bixby, was that you abstaining? Yes. All right, so the vote is um, approved by a vote of six to zero to two with Councilors Humphrey and Bixby abstaining. All right, last item.
108-24, Her Honor the Mayor requesting authorization to issue refunding bonds to refund all or any portion of the city's general obligation bonds. So Maureen, I'm gonna obviously turn to you on this, but correct me if I'm wrong, the chances of us actually doing this with the status of our bonds or the state of our bonds right now a slim and none, I believe, correct? No, that's why, uh, no, we actually have the bonds that were issued uh, on March 6th of 2014. Um, there is, I think it's 4 million or so of um, Anger that's outstanding and about nine and a half million of car. And again, either Ron or Steve, or Perry, any one of you correct me if I'm wrong. And so those have the potential for working. Um, we won't know that until we're getting closer to the sale date. And if things change in the market, um, it may or may not be to our advantage to refund those bonds. So um, then it's just that it's just that we have like one year basically for this to happen because of the 10 years that you mentioned earlier tonight. Exactly, exactly. Okay. All right, so I misunderstood. So it, it's really that, okay. Um, but why don't you go ahead and, and just quickly explain the item. You already explained that refunding is equal to refinancing, which I think people, um, including me, better understand, but go ahead and- And and so this, this gives us the authority that, um, you know, at, at any point in time. So this would be for everything that we've issued up through nowadays, um, the, the date of when the council order would be that when we are selling our bonds, which of course we do every year, we ask our financial advisors to take a look every year to see if we have any bonds that it makes sense to refund where we would save money. Um, and then we would just roll it into the bond sale um, and have all of our uh, paperwork for our um, our legal requirements that we need to to settle with bond council, we would have it all ready to go um, at any point in time. So that's why we ask um, for this type of an authorization so that if it makes sense that we can move forward whenever we're selling bonds uh, to refinance something, if it makes sense for us. Okay, questions? Okay, we've done this on several occasions in the past. Um, if there are no questions, can uh, can I get a motion, please? Motion to approve. Okay, motion to approve by Council Humphrey. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, motion passes unanimously, eight to zero. And uh, unless I've missed something, I believe that that concludes all of our work for this evening. Um, thanks again for great attendance, being on time, and a lot of um, a lot of good questions. All right. So, having said that, I wish everyone a, a good rest of the night, and um, we'll see you at the uh, full council meeting, if not soon. Anything else anybody has? In case I want to make sure I'm not missing anything. All right, then we're adjourned and um, have a good rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Good night.